Happy New Year, everybody. It's Joe. Before we get to our interview with the one and only George Hurley, a couple announcements. First of all, I just want to remind everybody to please subscribe to The Trap Set if you haven't already. You can do it on iTunes, RSS, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app, and that way you'll be sure never to miss an episode, and you'll never miss any of our bonus episodes either. In fact, there will be a couple bonus outtakes from today's interview with George. Also, we're really excited to bring the trap set in front of live audiences this year. Our first live podcast is going to take place at the incredible Revival Drum Shop in Portland, Oregon. That's going to be on Saturday, January 30th, and we're going to have an amazing panel of drummers. More details on that soon. But if you're in Portland, we'd love to see you. Finally, shout out to my friend Stephen for helping arrange this interview. Now let's get to it. This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Colectivo Coffee, handmade coffee since 1993. Check them out online at colectivo.com. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set, where each week we explore the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. Starting. You're hearing The Glory of Man by Minutemen, featuring my guest, George Hurley on drums. Minutemen formed in 1980 in San Pedro, a working-class port town south of Los Angeles. With a succession of beloved landmark albums, the band quickly established a reputation for startlingly original musical virtuosity and a ceaseless work ethic. Although the band was a product of the Southern California punk scene, Minutemen drew equal influence from punk's spiritual predecessors like Ornette Coleman, Captain Beefheart, and Charles Mingus, as it did from contemporaries such as Black Flag and Husker Du. Unburdened by formal training, Hurley's drumming is both primal and refined. His unstoppable and singular groove provided the spark that ignited the cerebral powder keg of ideas volleyed back and forth between bassist Mike Watt and guitarist and singer Dee Boone. Minutemen ended after the tragic death of Dee Boone in 1985, but Hurley continued his partnership with Watt in the prolific band Firehose. He's also explored psychedelic rock and experimental jazz with other projects such as the Red Crayola and Unknown Instructors. He still lives in San Pedro. And now I'm honored to present my conversation with George Hurley. No one in my family that I know of were musicians. What brought uh, the family out to the West Coast? And my dad, of course. He was a cobbler, shoemaker. Really? But yeah. Man, that's cool. Yeah, he came out here and got a job in the shipyards, uh, do, and he became a pipe fitter. Okay. And then he, he brought us out, I think, about yeah, six months later. So he joined and, the union, got a job out here? Yeah, right, at Todd Shipyards in San Pedro. There's a lot of shipbuilding going on in those days, you know, Long Beach and everything, so there's a lot of work. That's was there I'm less doing. work as a cobbler happening Probably. at that point? Yeah, I mean, Probably. it seems like a job for the uh, 19th century, and then by yeah. the mid, I mid 20th that. century, maybe less people were having their shoes made. Yeah, yeah, cobbler's custom. kind of an old-fashioned word for it, ain't it? Yeah, it's cool, though. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. how many siblings did you have? Well, I have uh, two other brothers and two other sisters. Oh, nice. That's how yeah. I am. Two yeah. brothers, two sisters. I'm the oldest. Me too, man. Know. All right. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? What did all your siblings end up doing? Any uh, of them, none well, of them became musicians? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Both my brothers did. They both, uh, when the punk rock thing started happening and I got into bands, so did my brother Greg. Uh, he's quite a, he's quite a, quite a prolific writer. He, got, he made his own instrument at, called an apple sizer which was like a wiffle ball with rocks in it, connect tape, duct tape to a microphone, and he'd just go crazy and rant all these different things and on stage and say a bunch of stuff. But he, was, he had his own band. And then my other brother, Mike, you know, the youngest, he also had a band too. 
Wow. He, okay. He became a drummer also. Greg, he just was just a stone uh, rapper, you know, <laughs> sort of early rapper. What was rapper. it called? The Apple? Apple Sizer is Apple what he called Sizer. It. Yeah. I guess because nice. the, the wiffle ball fit in his hand. The right. His hand, so he just go nuts and crazy and rant and rave on stage. <laughs> Kind of That's like really a, cool. Kind of like a Joanna Wint type thing, how she performs, if you're familiar with her. Yeah, she's, yeah. She's a performance artist. Yeah. So when you were growing up, what was the household like? Uh, well, the household was like, uh, well, we moved into the projects, of course, when we got there. But uh, there was a lot of fighting and arguing going on between the kids. All of us, but that's probably normal stuff for it was in family my family, like yeah, you know, but uh, the boys were the boys, and the girls were the girls. I have one sister uh, who's ten years younger than my youngest sister, okay, yeah, so we all came one the after bonus. another, you know, uh, every year, my mom had four kids, and then ten years later she had my youngest sister, and, and she got away with anything, probably well, yeah, she took all the attention away from us. <laughs> <laughs> How does it relate to me? You took my attention. Yeah. Were your folks uh, music fans? Well, I mean, they liked music, but uh, not 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 so much. But I'll tell you, I can remember getting our first stereo, a Longines Symphonette, and I got to pick two of the records that I wanted, which were Grand Funk, Railroad Live, and The Who, Happy Jack, The Who. Oh, nice. That was kind of a strange album. I, I, I really had to wrap my head around that one, that The Who album. Did you relate to what Keith Moon was doing right away? You know what? Absolutely. I really, uh, I kind of feel a connection with him because he's really an unorthodox drummer, kind of like what I am. I'm self-taught. Yeah. So I could relate to his impulses in a way because he really started out uh, measures and stuff in, <laughs> in a really kind of strange way, you know, not like a normal uh, the way you'd come into a normal measure, you know, to start a song or whatever. It's really kind of strange. Were you thinking about drums before you started playing drums? Always. So that always all, all stood life, out to you? I always wanted to be a drummer. Really? <clears throat> yes. So you don't remember, like, a moment where you saw someone on TV or, or something like that and it made you want to become a drummer? I saw all drummers yeah. growing up, and I, it's always one of what I wanted to do. I kind of got into music because uh, my cousin who was living here at the West Coast, too, my mom's sister. Little older cousin? Older cousin. She yeah, used to that's babysit what happened us, for me, you know. man, yes. But she'd come over with, like, a stack full of 45s, or Eric Burden, the Animals, the Beatles, you name it. She had them all. And she'd come over and babysit us, and those she those things would just drop one by one, you know, playing all the songs. So I really got into music. Yeah, my, she, co- my older cousin came over with all the SST stuff, and yeah. that's how I first discovered you. So yeah. good to have an older cousin. Yeah, <laughs> When did you start playing drums? Okay, so all my life I wanted a drum set. I really wanted one bad. I couldn't afford one, though. I finally got a drum set. Were you guys living in the projects your whole childhood? No, we, we finally moved out of the projects. We, we lived in a modest home. You know, we always lived by our schools, pretty close, up, actually, across the street. It was just by chance that I grew up across the street from all the schools. So, you know, I was always, always <clears throat> playing in them or golfing in them or football team in front of the elementary school in the front grass or whatever. But... Uh, I finally got my first drum set when I was like almost 20 years old. Mm. I traded it for a mini bike. But I'll tell you what, I played that thing every day for 10 hours a day. I wouldn't even get up and turn the light on. I had a shed in the back of my house, you know, like I was attached to a garage, so I had my own little room. So I'd just play in there, listen to my photo, phonograph or the radio stations and just try to play to that music. How did you get it loud enough? I wore headphones. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, when you're beginning, you're really pounding, <laughs> you're pounding <laughs> them hard. The, the poor neighbors, because when I brought that drum set home, oh, it was shit. every day after that. And they really, I had one neighbor come out and had me by the ear one day. You mm-hmm. know, he just, you know, I'm sorry about that, but I was just obsessed. 
And it was yeah. just like that from the second oh, you got geez, it. Oh, you kidding me? I was so scared someone would steal that drum set from me that I'd lock it into a trunk every time I was done playing. I heard about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you I'd must be there be 10 pretty... hours. I wouldn't turn on. It'd be dark, and I'd still be playing. What but... was your uh, process for getting into bands? Well, you know what? It was really was, <laughs> it was a crash course. I had been playing in my shed here probably for maybe about a, maybe a year, a little longer. And then I met up with Mike and D. Boone. And... Had you known them from school? You know, we went to school together, but no, I didn't know them in high school. We graduated the same year and everything. But uh, I was playing with my friends. You know, they'd come over and we'd party in my shed. We'd get our caterers or whatever and play rock and roll music. And, and what you know, some other guitar friends would come over. Then I met Mike and uh, we we did a few things together. And then he said, hey, I'm going to bring D. Boone over again. We started writing songs. We started a band, a four-piece band with a, a singer called The Reactionaries. Right. And uh, that lasted probably uh, about six months, I think. And then the band broke up. So when you initially played with uh, Mike and Dee, mm -hmm. did it feel like you had a special connection to them? Um, well, I guess, yeah, in a way, because we were, they had songs. And I started writing songs too, mainly lyrics. Of course, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm a self-taught musician. But uh, we're writing songs with the reactionaries. We had about probably 15 songs, I think. So I like that part of it. That we're really making something and producing something. It, it, the work, the work you put into it, you got out of it. Mm -hmm. And we got a pretty good uh, response from playing just parties around town. You know, it was fun. It was exciting. I loved it. You know. And then uh, uh, Marty, uh, we sh the band regrouped without the singer, Martin, and uh, that, the Minutemen were born. What else were you doing at the time? Were you working a day job? Oh, yeah, I always worked a day job. I always had a day job. What I did you do? Diesel mechanic work, uh, construction, a lot of construction work. I became a contractor, uh, well, 10 years after that. But I've always done that all my life, construction tile roofing concrete whatever you know that's how i got have you that. always been good at it or uh did you kind good of at learn what? It? like concrete at con work all that stuff <laughs> it takes skill man yeah yeah I'm, I'm yeah i've i've been pretty good at it yeah i've always had jobs and i still do i still do that you know even still now when you got back together with them or even when you were originally playing with them mm. what was the dynamic like i mean those guys we're best friends from an early age, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're the other guy. Mm -hmm. Did it all fit together, like, personally? Uh, did did those guys have their own language that was difficult for you to come no, in No, not on, really, or? because it all fit together. It did. I didn't meet D. Boone right away. I played some songs with Mike, and then Mike brought D. Boone. And then we had another guitar player come in. But with D. and him... I, I think mainly that's what was going to happen. They, they, those two, you know, wanted to really do it. And, of course, I wanted to be in a band, too. It just seemed to work. It just seemed to work. We, we made songs. We wrote them. We went to uh, <clears throat> some punk rock shows. We went to Redondo Beach uh, and met uh, uh, Black Flag at their place. They had this, this church over there. And uh, we got in with them, and we opened up some shows with them. We got, so it just went, it went by... Things happened, you know? Right. What, so, what was your ambition? Like, did you want to be in a band like well, you Black know, Flag? Or did you want to be a rock star like Foghat well, or something uh, like Well, I had some ambitions like both, you know? Well, it was always... Here's the thing. Punk rock really gave you a chance. Because you always seen rock stars as like, wow, these guys over here in these spandex suits and pretty hair and you really got to be really good you well you had it. pretty hair man yeah we got to get to that pretty. later <laughs> <laughs> what a mess i'll tell you but uh in a way punk rock was like you can do anything you want we'll play anything we want if you don't like it go listen to some other music you know i can be lame as i want you know in a way it cast off a lot of things so you can have as much fun as those guys and you don't have to be them you don't have to be up there. You know, you could just play your little gigs and people would come. So it kind of freed you up from feeling like, man, I'm just not good enough, you know? Did you feel that way? Probably, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I always felt, I still do. I, 
there's a lot of technical, technically good drummers out there, fantastic drummers all over the place. Well, if it, if it helps at all to know this, all of them that I've talked to still feel that way, too. You know, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> you well, know. that's good. Uh, that's nice to know. But uh, I always had to rely on like finding parts, making parts, just struggling to do it. And I think for everybody, probably it's the same, too. You've got to work and discipline yourself, find a way to make these parts fit. Minuteman was really only together for, like, what, six years? About that, yeah. And its legacy has just lasted, outlasted the band, and it will always be one of those bands. It will always be something... Who would ever like, have thought so? You never thought that when you were no, doing it. No, I didn't think punk rock would even last this long. What did you think would happen? Like, what were you... Well, were I you just, just in the moment, or...? Yeah, I th- kind of just thought it was a fad, you know? I didn't think it would go as far as it did. And even kids are listening to some of this early punk rock stuff, you know. Wow. But when you were playing in that band, I mean, it did have somewhat of a trajectory. Like, yeah, it, it did, absolutely. It kept going forward and forward and forward. Hell, within about a year and a half, I was already making records, full-length records. I was on tour, you know. Man, I was, I was doing it. It was hard work. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we, we had to blaze our own trail through America to play our music. You know, us, Black Flag. You know, we'd play in these small towns in Alabama, Texas, you know, just these little bars. And a lot of the people didn't even know, what the heck is this stuff? Mm. They were like, but they liked it, and they had us back. Sometimes the gigs would get canceled, and we'd have to find one or make one somewhere in town to make some gas money to get to the next one. Right. To eat, you know? Right. So it was, it was kind of a scary adventure in a way. Was it normally just the three of you, or would you bring other people along? Well, it's we would we would go with Black Flag in the early in the beginning, but we we, we branched away and did our own thing after that, you know, because we wanted to be independent, and and we did. We blazed our trails. We went on the road. We we grinded it out. We did our thing. We we accomplished a lot of a lot of states. Shoot, we'd go on tours. I think the last tour. That Miniman did was 73 shows in 78 days. Mm -hmm. So we used to work it, man. I mean, that's kind of the gold standard that lots of bands kind of aspire to, is is your model of doing things. Which Really? uh, Well, talk about what econo means. Doing things economically. Not getting a tour bus. Right. Taking your van. uh, Just not going for the rock and roll posh lifestyle. You know what I mean? Did any part of you wish that you were going for the rock and roll posh lifestyle? Uh, no, not really. Okay. Because I was already had a mindset. I'm a punk rocker now. Okay, okay. I'm not got into it. that all that crap. So did you ha- <laughs> did you stop listening, listening to all the stuff that you uh, grew up on for a while? Or have uh, to pretend that you're not into it anymore? No, not really. You can't okay. pretend that you're not into it if you liked it. Yeah, you yeah. Liked it. But uh, there was so much music out there. You didn't have to really go back. But it's you do go back and listen to your, some of your stuff when, when you miss it after a while. Mm-hmm. You know, those are your inspirations. Well, one of the great things is like on Double Nickels, you listed all of your inspirations yeah. on the cover <clears throat> of that. And lots of them weren't punk rock bands. And mm-hmm. it, it's just kind of cool that you were still embracing Van Halen or whatever else that was on there. Maybe Charlie Mingus was on there or something yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. When you were touring with Minutemen, would you always come back and work construction yeah, or whatever? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I always had a job. I was doing construction, or I was doing diesel ship work. Uh, I was. I became a machinist. I did that. Uh, 
but a couple other occupations, but yeah, I always worked. I, I bought a house when I was 20 years old, and I didn't make all the money from music. Right. I did it from working mostly. Right. You know, but it helped. You know, music started making a little more money for us as we went. And, uh, but yeah, I've always worked. I had to work when I got home. You were talking about how you were all kind of different guys. Mm -hmm. Did did you clash a lot? Well, sure. I mean, you're on the road. Whenever you're stuck in a van with two other you guys. You better believe it. Yeah. You better believe it. Yeah, sure. Uh, I I clashed with Mike a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, Mike clashed with D a lot. But uh, you know what? I really uh, never really clashed with D. Mm. D was pretty even keeled, pretty mellow. So was he and kind I of... was I am too in, in a lot of ways. Mike's a little more high strung than than us, me and D. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so naturally, you know. But we'd have our arguments, but you know, we have our fights, but hey, after that it's over. Go for it. We never really held any resentment or anything like that against each other. We know we had shows to do, things to do, we had responsibilities, we did them. We were responsible. For people that aren't familiar with Minutemen and Firehose, could you just talk a little bit about what ended the band? Well, the Minutemen, uh, unfortunately, just came off a three-month tour. We did our <clears throat> an extra month with R.E.M., which was really kind of fun. And we came home uh, Friday, I think it was a Friday, about 5 o'clock. And uh, Dee was sick. He had a little cold or something. Well, I guess his girlfriend wanted to go to Arizona to uh, see her mom for the holidays. And uh, they jumped back in the van and took off. I guess she was driving. And who knows why? I think she fell asleep at the wheel, unfortunately. And they went off the road and de -boomed. He lost his life, unfortunately. Mm. And so uh, a couple of years went by after that. And uh, me and Mike talked about putting another band together. And this kid from Ohio, Ed, Ed from Ohio, calls up and says, I want to be in a band with you guys. <laughs> he called up Mike, actually. <clears throat> and for some reason, Mike said, yeah, come on up. You know, so Ed came out. He was living with Mike at the time. Mike was going to teach him all the tunes before he introduced him to me. And Ed was, he was, he wasn't a, he was just an average guitar player. He, re he really was a beginner, like we were. But he learned, he learned fast. He learned to be a very good guitar player, a very good singer. You know, and it was, it, it really so worked out well. he just called up out of the blue? Yeah, pretty much. That's it. He had seen the band before in Ohio when we come and play in town, but uh, somehow he got Mike's number and he called. He's a trumpet player, really. He's huh. really good on trumpet, but... So he had a musical concept together. Oh, yeah, he did. He did, but he was pretty much a beginner at the guitar, but I don't think he really thought Mike was going to say, come on out. <laughs> <laughs> So in a way, that kind of works for us because we don't have somebody already established with their own idea of what they want to do or, or any kind of clashing. He's more, you know, pliable, you mm -hmm. know, so he, he was easier to work with and teach him what we know. And He was receptive. Receptive to, yeah, everything, you know. So it worked out good. By that point, uh, were you kind of in touch with – how Minutemen was perceived? Like, I mean, you're considered to be this legendary band. Like, what? No. But on a day-to-day no, -day 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 level, is that something that even no. crossed your mind? Now I, got, I kind of look back at it, and I listen to my drum parts. Back then I thought, oh, I was struggling through it. I wasn't really all that impressed with my playing, you know. But now, <laughs> now when I listen back, I just go like, wow, jeez, how did I do that? You know, it really, it really kind of inspires me in a way. Uh, it's, it's some of it's kind of amazing. Yeah. You know, but back then I thought, oh God, man, she's amazing. But I really wasn't impressed with myself. Tell me about uh, why you cut off the unit, man. What's going on? <laughs> I didn't cut off the unit. Right. It's still up here. There's still some oh, left shit. here. There's a little bit. <laughs> you just pulled it out. <laughs> oh, my God. When I decided to grow that, 
Jeez. So, okay, tell, tell everybody what the unit is. Uh, the unit, uh, that's what Mike Watt calls it. It's this hair that I grew out of, the, out of my forehead, just a chunk of hair. I got curly hair, so and it, when it was about 10 inches long, oh, my God. Where man. did the concept come from? I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking, but I, I just grew it out, and I just let it kept going, and it looked like a jiffy pop was thrown on top of my head. <laughs> But I'll tell you, that thing, it would get stuck in everything. You know, I'd be playing gigs, and uh, the sticks get a little frayed, you know. If it, if I got anywhere near my hair, the stick was stuck in there, and I couldn't get it out. And I'd oh. have to just play with a stick hanging from my, my in front of my face, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it really was a mess. It was, but I did I did manage to incorporate it in into my drumming by spinning it around and giving it a little bit of rhythm. Uh huh. <laughs> once it had a good amount of weight, I could do that. This guy that played with Count Basie once told me that he uses his head as the metronome when he's playing. Yeah, yeah. I so used to do with the yours, same. it was like much more clear to the audience what was going on because yeah. the unit was flapping around. Yeah, it did. It did help me to keep time and keep the groove going. But also, I thought, oh wow, man, it looks maybe it looks kind of flashy. You know, like I'm really, really going crazy up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez I was going crazy like <laughs> this is in my mouth and it <laughs> so when you would come back off of tour with those guys would you all hang out or were you like sick of them and you would go do your own thing and go surfing and hang out with your surf buddies uh, and stuff we never we didn't really hang out that much but we were always doing something doing gigs we're always doing or at a barbecue we always were together we were always doing stuff together we never were apart from each other for any long amount of time. And when you play, uh, you and Watt still get together once in a while and play mm-hmm. some of those Minutemen songs, just the two of you? Yeah. How does that feel? That, the first time we did that, that was amazing. Did you it have feels, to get in shape to do it? Did you have to uh, practice? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You got to practice. Yeah, to, to get the songs right and together. And we have to do a little bit of singing. He does a lot, a lot of it. But you know what the funny thing is? You can hear the guitar. Wow. You can hear it. It's really weird. But you play it, and then, you know, you're playing along, and just like, it's just there. And then a lot of people, like if, like at those gigs that we did, there's some new people there. They didn't even notice there wasn't a, a guitar player. So wow. it's kind of kind of blew my mind in a way, but some, but uh, it's really kind of neat. It's like a... I mean, do you believe in supernatural things? Like, do you think maybe it was a spirit coming down and visiting you guys? Uh, well, that sounds nice and everything, but I think it's just, you, it was just ingrained in your memory. Mm-hmm. So it really was there. You created it. You're playing the songs, so you're recreating it. So wow. It, it was really, and, and actually, it was really, I really liked doing that. That was fun. It really, it was, it was pleasing. How old's your kid? He just turned 13. Oh boy. Yeah. He's taller than me. Good kid? Yes. And and just one yeah. kid. You just have one yeah. kid, right? <clears throat> just one kid. How did that change the game for you when you had a kid? Uh, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't. Okay. It made me more inspired. Did it make you learn how to manage your time better? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and and when you say when you say it made you more inspired, did it did it change the way that you approached music at all, or did it change the way you felt when you were yeah, playing? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I wrote songs that definitely influenced. It's just the joyous part of it. And he's a, he's a great kid. I love him. He really is a good kid, mm-hmm. and he's he's a musician. He definitely is. Are you still married to the? To I'm his worried mom? about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've had a pretty good life, right? Uh, yeah, I can't complain. I can't are, are, complain. are you still married? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay, unfortunately, okay. bless her heart. He's got a wonderful mom. Okay, great. A- and you know, on a day to day level, are you a pretty happy person these days? Yeah, I'm always a happy person. Yeah, yeah. you Absolutely. get out and surf ever? Yes, yes, I you do. I do? started surfing again probably about four years ago. I took a good 20-year hiatus from it. I used to surf all the time before I got a drum set. I, wow. used to, I, I went to Hawaii. I went, went to Hawaii three times, you know, just to go surf. Once in high school, two times after. 
I used to surf all over. That's all I ever did was surf. I was even making surfboards. I was a surfer. I've built a few things in my life, but I, I just don't have that natural talent to be able to just build anything that I need. Yeah. That's just well, something that you had, or was it yeah, taught it's to just you by your that, parents or anything? No, I taught it to myself, too. Uh, it's just so you're just a self-taught. I like guy. I like building things. I like crafts. I like I like glues. I like adhesives. I like fasteners. I like stuff like that. Have you ever built drums? Uh, I've I've gave it a lot of thought, and I had some ideas, but I haven't attempted it. Okay. Because a, a round piece of wood, you need special tools. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time I ever get around to that, there ain't gonna be no wood left. Right. <laughs> so, so what I made you, plenty of drumsticks. That's about as close as I got. I mean, that's more than most people have done. I did make some steel drums, though. Oh, cool. I did. I, back in the day, you can get five gallon. Uh, They're like kerosene drums, right? But it had a real good tinny sound, and I'd wrap my drumsticks with these with tape. And it's on, it's on a Minuteman record. Uh, East Wind, it's called, and mm. I, I play them on that, and they're just oh, they sound great. I wish I wouldn't. Have, I don't know how I lost those. Wish I would have kept them. Do you have any uh, art- artistic goals moving forward? Uh, artistic goals, like creative goals. You want to like make painting. Enough, make more records or whatever. As it as an as a musician. As a musician. Right now, I'm not really part of any kind of project or anything. Uh. But you never know what can happen. I, I'm open and willing to experiment and do things. And I, I try little projects with different people. A lot of times it's hard to get them together. But uh, right now... Do you feel like you have really high standards? Hell no. No? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not really at, at all. Okay. No. If, I, if I'm playing with other people, if I have anything to share with them that's good or positive, I will. And you still get off on it the same way? Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. Well, I, I, with my son, I, you know, he, he I thought he'd be a drummer. Well, he is a drummer. He's got a feel for it. But he's into guitar really heavy. And I, I, I try and teach him some things that I've learned, just like, you know, how to understand music, how to uh, convey it emotionally, how to get the feel for it. Because like, he, he just started playing guitar like four months ago. He's got like four guitars. He's, he's playing like all these songs, like Chicago and Jimi Hendrix uh, leads. Oh, wow. You know, but not the whole songs all the way through. He picks this stuff off the internet, but he, it's like all this old school stuff that I listen to. You know, I said, where are you getting this from? Ah, the internet. But I said, you got to start learning to play songs all the way through, not just pieces of them. And Does he ever listen to your records? Yeah, he always and has. And he's into it. And his mom would play them for him too. Yeah, Man, he's that's cool. Yep. It could have gone one of two ways. He could have rebelled against you. Not, <laughs> he still not could. Down. Yeah, he still could. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> he's getting to an age where that would happen, right? So now he's coming over, and I told him, start learning some songs all the way through so I can play drums and you can play guitar. And I'll show you how to play, you know, with with another person. Yeah, and that's I, what really did it and for he's, me. he's really got a good feel for it, like the timing and the feeling and the emotional part of it, because you got to learn rhythm and the... And the chords and everything, he, he's he's really got a feel for it. He's really good at it. So I think he's going to definitely be a musician. Mm. But I won't let him, if I'm around, I'm not going to let him quit school or an education for it. Did you quit school? I never went to college. I only, went, I only have a high school. Well, I went to occupational trade school for a couple of years. And is that a regret? No. No. No, not at all. I took an air conditioning course so, and finished it, but I so never got even into it. Even if your kid was really into music, and you could see that he had a potential in it, you wouldn't let him quit. You'd want him to go to college. It'd be a fine line, you know. Really, yeah, I'd want to see him have something for himself when he got older, right? Retirement that's, that's and stuff smart. like that. Stuff that I don't have. Uh huh. You know. So I'm gonna have to work till I drop dead, pretty much. But I'll. Maybe your, kid be will become a, maybe your kid will become a rock star and you can uh, provide well, for you. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> is he a good Is he a, a good student? Yes, he he's, is. Okay. He is. He's, he's really, I couldn't ask for a better son. Well, George Hurley, thank you so much for doing this. It's really an honor. <laughs> well, thank you very much. 
The Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Thank you.